Madam Speaker. I think there are many in this place who know that I have long awaited the opportunity to debate this bill again. Uh, it is Bill C-438, an act to establish a Canadian Environmental Bill of Rights, and to make related amendments to the act because that includes an amendment to the Bill of Rights. Madam Speaker, this is the fourth time that, that I have tabled this bill in 11 years in this place over three parliaments. Uh, the first time I believe that I tabled it as soon as I was elected, uh, somewhere between 2008 and 2009, and uh, um, that bill was debated and I went through committee, but I'll get into that in a minute. So I hope today in the brief time I'm allotted to say what is an Environmental Bill of Rights, what's its origin, why is it needed, and who has endorsed the need for Environmental Bill of Rights. So the Environmental Bill of Rights legally extends the right to a healthy, ecologically balanced environment to Canadians. It confirms the duty of the Government of Canada to uphold their public trust duty to protect the environment. It amends the Bill of Rights to add environmental rights, and it extends a bundle of rights and tools to Canadians, including to have a voice in decisions impacting their health and environment, standing before co courts and tribunals, the power to hold the government accountable on effective environmental enforcement, and on the review of law and policies. It extends protections for government whistleblowers who release information uh, relevant to health and environmental impacts to Canadians. As I mentioned, I have tabled this four times over in three successive governments. Mm -hmm. um, my bill actually survived a challenge and uh, gained uh, speakers ruling in my favor uh, when the Conservatives tried to crush it in 2009. Um, it did proceed to second reading and on to committee. Sadly, Madam Speaker, it was essentially shredded at committee. It then died on the order paper when the early election was called. I retabled again, as I mentioned, in 2011, 2015, and again in a revised, updated form in 2019. So, Madam Speaker, why is an Environmental Bill of Rights needed? Community Non-government organizations and indigenous voices are absolutely critical triggers for action to protect the health and the environment. Federal law and policy is made all the stronger with public engagement. Mm -hmm. Public rights are absolutely critical to government accountability. And Madam Speaker, that has been my direct experience over almost 50 years that I have been an environmental lawyer and advocate. And I want now to give a couple of examples of what happens when the public is engaged and their rights are upheld, and what happens when they're not. One strong example is uh, an engagement that I had along with a small community organization in Alberta dealing with how to improve air emissions from coal-fired power. And coal-fired power is still the major source of electricity in Alberta, in Saskatchewan, and huge in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. Um, Mercury from coal-fired power is the largest source of industrial mercury in North America. And mercury is a neurotoxin. It was the first substance listed by the federal government under the former Contaminants Act and then incorporated into the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. And yet, to this day, the federal government has never regulated mercury from coal-fired power. So I intervened as a volunteer in the review of the standards, and it's a consensus process. I dug in my hills. If industry wanted to get their emission standards for NOx, sulfur dioxide, uh, particulate, they had to agree to my recommendation that mercury had to be captured by that sector. And there had to be a law in place. To the credit of the Alberta government, they enacted that law. That's a clear example where had my community not intervened, neither the federal provincial government would have stepped forward after 40 years of burning coal in Alberta to actually stop the flow of mercury into our lakes. Another example that we've been talking about over the last couple of months in this place, Madam Speaker, is the issue of mercury at Grassy Narrows. Mm -hmm. Now there, Madam Speaker, is an example. If the, indi the indigenous community at Grassy Narrows had been directly engaged in decisions on how those industrial operations were going to operate in the community and along the river, and on the issue of whether or not it was safe to put the effluent into the river that had high levels of mercury contamination. If they had been given the information on the potential health and environmental impacts 
I do, and, a, and a seat at the table to have a say in how that plan should operate. I do not believe that we would be facing the health impacts and the expense of cleaning up that area now. Good point. So those are the two differences of what happens when you have some environmental rights and the opportunity to be at the table and access to information. The other grassy narrows is an example where we do not do that and we have a very costly health-wise and financially. At Sarnia, I've raised a number of times in this place the concern with the impact on the Indigenous community next to the Sarnia Industrial Complex of the emissions and the failure of both levels of government to combat those and, and to do proper health studies and, and control. And that community has struggled to just get the basic information on what the emissions are, whether there's controls in place, and whether it's impacting their health. The oil sands, Madam Speaker, ongoing frustration by the Indigenous communities in, in Northern Alberta to finally have a health impact study delivered in their communities on the impact of oil sands emissions on their health, despite the fact that there was a release quite some years ago about the level of a high rate of, of rare cancers. And a lot of the work of scientists showing the buildup of contaminants in the Athabasca River and in the air and on the lands. Um, just this week, three chiefs in that area actually published in the Hill Times an article. They've said, look, um, it's the only activity in our area for employment and economic development. We invest in the oil sands, but we demand to have a seat at the table on decisions whether or not we're going to allow the draining of those tar ponds, the contaminated water, into the Athabasca River. It's going to contaminate the Athabasca River onto Lake Athabasca and on into the, into the Northwest Territories. All these years that these have been going on, and the government behind closed doors and making these decisions. A perfect example where if we had an Environmental Bill of Rights, those communities would have the right to all that information, to exactly the process that's going on, and to have a seat at the table, and in the determination of whether or not that is a wise decision. Again, uh, the Miccosu Cree eventually had to actually go to UNESCO to demand that there be action on the impact of the Site C Dam, the Bennett Dam, and the oil sands operations on the Peace Athabasca Delta, and the World Heritage Site. And they issued directives, and we're still waiting for the government to actually act on those. Two other final examples, pipelines. <laughs> if the former Conservative government had actually listened to their advisors, if they had, had listened to the First Nations, if they listened to the environmental community, they would have known they could not proceed with a gateway pipeline until they had actually respected First Nation rights and interests. On the TMX pipeline, the same issue, but as the court held, also, there was not consideration under the, the government obligations under endangered species. Therefore, th those projects have been stalled or, or, or cancelled. Another example of, if you actually have an Environmental Bill of Rights that clarifies the right to participate, the access to the information, the access to experts, the access to legal counsel so that you can come to the table in a constructive, informed way. So, Madam Speaker, who has endorsed this concept? Well, some provinces and territories have actually enacted an array of environmental rights. And some of these limited rights have been enacted in federal laws. Um, sadly, a good number of those laws were downgraded by the Harper government. They downgraded the federal impact assessment process, limiting the opportunities of people to, to participate, and frankly, the kinds of projects that would be reviewed, and including the expansion of oil sands projects and in situ op operations. The Liberals promised when they ran in the campaign in 2015 they would immediately strengthen federal environmental laws. Well, four years into, into it, no action on the report of my committee on reforming SEPA, which would have expanded environmental rights, and we don't know what the fate of C69 is. We're all waiting with bated breath of what will happen to all of those regressive amendments proposed in the Senate. The North American Agreement Environmental Cooperation was a side agreement to the NAFTA agreement. And I had the privilege of working there for four years as the head of law and enforcement. And that agreement, under that agreement, Canada, along with Mexico and the United States, actually committed to public participation in conserving, protecting, enhancing the environment, the opportunity to comment on proposed environmental measures, the right to seek uh, um, a report on effective environmental enforcement, standing before administrative quasi-judicial and judicial proceedings, and the right to be, have access to, to remedies. Exactly the provisions that are in the bill that you have before you today. So Canada already committed years ago 
that they would move forward and uphold these rights. And so I have tabled this proposal over and over again to try to encourage the government to come forward. I'll speak about that in a minute, about uh, what this government could have done and who actually asked this government to do something, um, to respond to the current trade law. Now, there is a side agreement to the proposed new trade law. Sad to say, it's downgraded from the existing one. All of the trade deals that have been signed on and signed and sealed since NAFTA have downgraded those environmental rights that were enshrined in the, the side agreement. The United Nations Human Rights Council Special Rapporteur was asked to look into human rights obligations relating to the enjoyment of a clean, safe, healthy, sustainable environment. He traveled the world for four years and he issued on behalf of the Human Rights Council an environmental bill of rights framework for all nations to adopt. And guess what? It's exactly the framework of my bill. Over 90 nations have extended these rights through constitutions, laws, court rulings, international treaties, or declarations. Canada is just simply far behind. In 2009, there was an Aarhus Convention signed by many countries of the world, by and large European and Scandinavian nations. And that committed the signatories to provide access to information, public participation, decision-making, and access to justice and environmental matters. Canada said they didn't have to sign because they were already extending those rights. But in fact, they have not done that yet. And recently, to the credit of many in this place, many members of parliament have signed the environmental rights pledge issued by the David Suzuki Foundation through the Blue, Blue Dot campaign. And we had a big celebration on Monday night here, celebrating the fact that so many par parliamentarians are committed to enacting environmental rights. Here's an interesting one. In 2018, the Liberals held a federal convention and they passed a resolution. And that resolution said, reminded the members of the Liberal Party that in June 2010, all Liberal members of Parliament, pres present in the House of Commons, voted in favor of Bill C-469. Guess what? That was my Environmental Bill of Rights. Um, they reminded the members of the Liberal Party that the United Nations recognizes environmental rights as a basic human right. And they then passed a resolution saying that the Liberal Party of Canada urged the Government of Canada to enact legislation establishing a Canadian Environmental Bill of Rights. Um, I have said all along, I've said it since the first day it was elected in 2008, I would welcome that the government of the day take my bill and enact a full-fledged mm -hmm. bill. Yeah. But here we are, a couple yeah. of weeks left in this place, and nothing has occurred. So uh, that is why I'm delighted that I can actually debate the bill, and I'm looking forward to the response of some of my colleagues. Over 3,000 Canadians to date have signed petitions, both e-petitions and, and hard petitions, saying that they support the enactment of this Environmental Bill of Rights. Eco-Justice, the David Suzuki Foundation, and most recently, the Social Justice Cooperative of Newfoundland, it was mm -hmm. interesting to discover, have come out and endorsed this bill and called for the action by the government to enact this law. So, Madam Speaker, um, I am looking forward to hearing uh, the comments from uh, other parties in the House. It's been my absolute pleasure to work with uh, other members of Parliament on environmental matters. I know that there are some strong uh, promoters of environmental rights here, and I'm hoping that I'm going to hear from them this evening. And I'm happy to take questions. Questions and comments? Questions et commentaires? The Honourable Member for Sandwich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's such an honour that I'm able to put this question to my friend from Edmonton, Strathcona, who has decided not to run again, and whose stalwart environmental work, and I have to admit, Madam Speaker, as a former environmental lawyer, I think I first started working with the Honourable Member for Edmonton, Strathcona, in around 1984, maybe. We look younger than we really are. But this is such an essential piece of legislation. She has tried so hard for so long, and I want to commit to her that I'll do everything possible as leader of the Green Party to promote the Environmental Bill of Rights in the next election campaign because I don't think we can get it through this parliament in the time remaining. But those members here from all sides of the House who recognize that it's long overdue, I urge you to take to your party the demand 
that every party in this place put in their platform running in the next election that we will deliver an environmental bill of rights to Canadians, one that's long overdue. And I thank the Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona for her tireless work. She will be missed in this place. The our member for Edmonton, uh, uh, Strathcona. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And I'd like to thank uh, my colleague in the House. Um, gosh, uh, I thought we've been working since 1979. I have been. <laughs> You're Johnny come lately. We had we had a lot of fun working on many campaigns together. Thank you very much to the honourable member. The one thing I forgot to mention is an endorsement of environmental bill of rights is already in our party's platform. So I'm delighted to hear that the representative for the Green Party is saying that she wants to put forward in her platform, and I'm looking forward to being in everybody's platform. But what I really want is it not just to be in people's platforms. Whoever becomes government, if it's a minority government and other parties are holding them accountable, let's hold the government accountable to actually enact an environmental bill of rights. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Hastings, Lennox, Addington. I'd like to uh, congratulate uh, the member from Edmonton Strathcona for getting this bill uh, before the House uh, once again. Uh, it was, truly was a pleasure and an honour to work with her on the Environment Committee. I think we did a lot of good work together and had a lot of, struck a great friendship. Uh, and I too am going to miss her very much uh, in this place. Um, I wanted to uh, um, ask the member, uh, as we were, we've discussed in the past, Ontario has a, an Environmental Bill of Rights. Uh, and a mechanism uh, that exists within that Bill of Rights is an Environmental Review Tribunal. Make sure to remember that during the, the amendment phase of Bill C-69, one of the areas that I was strongly promoting was to have an Environmental Review Tribunal. Unfortunately, that didn't happen, but is that uh, part of the model that the member is, is uh, the framework that the member has is, is looked to as, as part of this bill as well? The R member for Edmonton Strathcona. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the member for his kind comments, and in fact, it was a delight to work with him on the committee. He's one member I missed. Um, there's another one that will be speaking soon. Uh, my bill was never intended to be the full Environmental Bill of Rights. That's a job for the government, right? The Ontario Environmental Bill of Rights is much deeper than mine and gives all the detail of, of the proceedings. Um, the, the framework of my bill would fully allow for the development of the mechanism that the member is speaking of. There are many mechanisms that exist at the provincial level that have not been carried forward to the federal level. And I, and I think it would be well worthwhile to have an open dialogue and consultation across the country about how best to set up this law when a government becomes elected and moves forward to enact it. But I would hope that it would move expeditiously. Um, I should mention that there are provinces that have actually put some of these measures into their specific laws. Um, Quebec specifically has an Environmental Bill of Rights. It's not terribly detailed. I believe in both Yukon and Northwest Territories laws, there is a form of Environmental Bill of Rights. So we have examples that we can, can turn to in building a federal one. We don't have to start, start at zero. Resuming debate, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I'd like to begin by thanking the Honourable Member from Edmonton Strathcona for her uh, work in introducing this bill, but also for her advocacy and passion for issues around the environment. We crossed over for a very short time uh, when I was a brand new member of Parliament on the Transport Committee, and I admired, admired her uh, intelligence, her work ethic, and her ability to bring a perspective that represented her constituents' interests to, to every issue. Uh, the proposed uh, bill would establish a Canadian Environmental uh, Bill of Rights. Uh, some substantive and, and procedural rights would be built into that. And perhaps uh, before I get uh, uh, too deep into my remarks, I'd like to advise the Honourable Member that uh, the government is, is supportive of this bill at second reading to send it to committee. Of course, as the member from Saanich Gulf Islands uh, raised, there's a limited amount of time in this parliament. Uh, but as uh, the, uh, the sponsor of the bill did recognize in her remarks, our party membership at our convention in April uh, 2018, uh, we're also behind this I idea, which I think is, is deserving of an analysis, so we can better understand how adding a level of justiciability to environmental protections will actually enhance the quality of our environment for, for Canadians. Um, Madam Speaker, I, I note in particular, uh, a as a result of the committee study on, uh, on SEPA uh, done in 2017, 
Uh, the government had tabled a response indicating it would be undertaking a, a consultation uh, that would uh, identify how to implement uh, this kind of a, uh, um, a level of, uh, I guess, uh, adding a rights-based approach uh, to environmental protections under that piece of legislation. This consultation uh, is ongoing. Uh, I think before we get too deep into the technical aspects, it's important to reflect on why this is all important. Uh, the environment is... Uh, is an important priority for, for any party that might find itself in government and for all Canadians. Uh, we rely on it for our, for our livelihood, uh, we rely on it for our health, uh, and it's not just us. It's, uh, n nature is important for protecting for its own sake. Uh, I note in particular um, what an eye-opening experience it's been for me to serve in this capacity as Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Uh, one of the things that has jumped out uh, uh, at me every time I read an article or visit a community um, that has uh, seen the impacts of uh, wildlife loss. Uh, since the 1970s, Madam Speaker, we've seen 60% of the world's wildlife uh, lost. Uh, in Canada, we represent three quarters of the world's, uh, along with uh, four other countries, represent three quarters of the world's remaining wilderness. Uh, we have an opportunity and, in my mind, an obligation to do something about it. I note in particular the historic investment we, we made of $1.3 billion towards protecting nature. This is the single largest investment in protecting our natural environment in the history of our country. Uh, we're seeing projects roll out that are pr protecting critical habitat, uh, that are protecting spaces for uh, multi-species that will benefit from it uh, for generations going forward. Uh, we've got examples in my own, uh, my own riding along the St. Mary's River or the Muscadabit River Valley that are home to important ecosystems that uh, house species at risk but also serve as important uh, climate mitigation uh, infrastructure that occurs naturally and perhaps more effectively than uh, mankind is able to develop on their own. But of course a healthy environment is not just uh, about, uh, about protecting uh, nature and biodiversity loss. Uh, of course we've got the looming threat of climate change as well. Uh, we cannot uh, depend on human health if we don't have environmental health. Uh, Madam Speaker, when I see uh, coal plants uh, continuing to burn for uh, potentially decades, uh, we know that we're putting our, our communities at risk, a uh, heightened risk for lung disease and, and for childhood asthma, among other things. Uh, when I see uh, the storm surges on the East Coast that pose a physical risk to the residents that live there, the heat waves that have taken lives in Ontario and Quebec, or the fi forest fires that continue to rage in Western Canada, I know that we have a responsibility to take action because it really does impact uh, a person's uh, right to, uh, to, to live if they don't have an environment that allows that to take place. Uh, that's why we've embarked uh, on the implementation of an ambitious agenda to reduce our emissions so we can reach the, uh, the level of reductions in order to prevent the worst consequences of climate change. Uh, we know, Madam Speaker, that Canada is warming at twice the rate of the global average and that we are feeling the consequences today. That's why we're moving forward with a plan that includes over 50 measures to help reduce our emissions. Of course, we talk at length in this chamber about the government's uh, initiative to put a price on pollution. Uh, what we're seeing is by 2030, we're actually going to have 90% of our electricity generated from non-emitting sources. Uh, Madam Speaker, we've made the single largest investment in the history of public transit in Canada. At the same time, we're taking advantage of the uh, uh, opportunities in the green economy by protecting our environment. If you're to believe Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of England, there is a $26 trillion global opportunity in the green economy. And by positioning ourselves on the front end of that wave, we can actually do the right thing for our environment uh, protect the health of our communities and capitalize on an economic opportunity as well. Uh, Madam C D Speaker, it would be irresponsible uh, not to take these actions uh, based on the crass economics alone, but we also know that there's a moral obligation to take this action. Uh, turning my mind to the, um, uh, more directly to the issue of the substantive and pro procedural protections that could arise under an Environmental Bill of Rights, I want to point out that we do have uh, substantive and procedural rights that exist under federal legislation and policies today that do provide important rights to Canadian citizens that could potentially be complemented if we better understand how a Bill of Rights could add to the protections, uh, both substantive and procedural, that exist. I, I note in particular, under uh, the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, CEPA, uh, there are opportunities for, for public participation when it comes to the pollutants that we deal with in our society. We also know that there's uh, protections for whistleblowers who uh, report those who violate uh, the federal laws that are on the books. There's obligations around transparency uh, for, for companies that, um, uh, that use uh, uh, pollutants. And there's an opportunity for uh, individuals or, or groups to take uh, civil action uh, against offenders of the obligations laid out in that, uh, in, in that piece of legislation. And we are making efforts today to enhance our transparency through proactive disclosure of information relating to the pollutants that we know are making their way into Canada today. 
You know, good information is, is necessary. If we're not basing our decisions on facts, science, and evidence, we can't have much faith that the decisions we're making are going to lead to the outcomes that we want to see. I know it was uh, disappointing for me uh, during the last Parliament, before I got involved, uh, to see that there was a, a, an effort to limit uh, how much federal scientists could talk about their own research. I know in uh, Nova Scotia, it was a, a big deal at home when we saw that the research that existed on the books at the Bedford Institute of Oceanography uh, be, be disposed of. These kind of information uh, exist for a reason, and it's to help legislators make good policy that will improve the quality of our environment. I, I know there's other pieces of legislation at play as well uh, that do provide uh, public rights to take part in dis, uh, discussions around the, uh, the quality of our environmental laws. If you look at the Species at Risk Act, any person can apply for a status assessment of a given uh, species. They can also request uh, an assessment of, of imminent threat, and there's a duty on the, uh, the government uh, to make, uh, make public information about the status of different species. Uh, these are, are rights uh, so, so the public can understand what information is out there, what research has the government done, so they can better understand what policies are being implemented or perhaps not being implemented and advocate for change that will help protect our environment. The uh, piece of legislation, Bill C-69, has come up over the course of the, the debate already. Uh, one of the things that this, uh, this piece of legislation was designed to do was to improve the public participation in the decision-making process around major projects, including the need for early engagement that gave the public an opportunity to take part before all the decisions had been made, which will eventually be litigated on the back end. In particular, we made a serious effort to help bring in the, uh, the voices of Indigenous communities across Canada to ensure that they have an opportunity to participate as well. Uh, again, under C-69, we'll improve the public registry so the public can actually have access in a timely way to the information about projects that are being proposed so they can understand not only the opportunities for participation, but the current status of projects, the potential adverse social health or environmental consequences that could arise as projects go forward. Because it's all about making sure good projects can proceed and uh, the economy can grow at the same time that we're making sure that the social outcomes that we want to see, in particular, the protection of our environment uh, is, is not lost. Uh, we also have pieces of law like the Federal Sustainable Development Act, which puts obligations on the government to enhance the accountability and transparency of the work of federal departments when we're moving forward with, uh, with laws or policies that could have a potential uh, negative impact on our ability to live sustainably in our environment. Uh, but the question is, why, why do we need to uh, advance this piece of legislation to the next stage to better understand the consequences uh, that, that could arise? The, the protections, uh, substantive and procedural, that I just laid out, uh, quite frankly, are a bit of a, a, a exist in a scattered way. Uh, to have a, uh, the, the idea of having a central bill of rights that could potentially uh, allow the public to better understand uh, where their substantive and procedural rights exist is something that's appealing to me and I think deserves to be better understood. Um, when I look at um, what environmental justice means to me, and, and I see uh, I'm running out of time, Madam Speaker, um, we have to uh, ensure that people who are disproportionately impacted uh, by decisions around the environment, whether it's elderly people, uh, whether it's uh, children who will disproportionately bear the consequences of climate change, whether it's expectant mothers who have a different impact on their personal health and, and the health of their child, these are serious things that we should be considering. And uh, to understand how to best implement the procedural and, uh, and substantive rights, I think this bill is worth sending to committee so we can better understand them. I look forward to continuing with the, the conversation with my honorable colleague uh, offline uh, to ensure that we don't lose the momentum behind this idea because, quite frankly, I think it's an important discussion to be had uh, to determine whether we should move forward with an environmental bill of rights. And I want to thank uh, the folks back home in central Nova who've uh, raised this with me. It's important, and I welcome your advocacy.